The peaceful rivers of North Carolina are not a place you would expect a terrifying true crime case to unfold. But for Irina Yarmolenko, that's exactly what happened. A young couple were out jet skiing on the Catawba River one afternoon when they got the shock of their lives. As they passed a small embankment, they noticed something odd lying on the riverbanks. At first, they probably thought it was just a bundled up pile of clothes, maybe some sort of animal taking a nap. But as they drew nearer, they realized this was no animal. This was a human body, and they just walked right into a crime scene. Irina Yarmolenko was known to her friends and relatives as Ira, and they described her as someone who had always had a sunny spirit, and who found it easy to make new friends no matter where she went. She originally came from Ukraine, but in the 1990s, her family fled from the country and headed to the US, eventually settling in North Carolina. Her parents managed to find work in Greensboro and found a home in Chapel Hill where they could live peacefully and raise their kids. In 2008, Ira was studying at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte after graduating from Chapel Hill High School in 2006. And in May of that year, she made the decision to finish out her semester there before planning to transfer to the university's Chapel Hill campus, where she intended on obtaining a public health major. When it came to her studies, Ira was known to be very dedicated and focused, and she also had hobbies of playing tennis and the piano. She also loved to spend time traveling around the country, since she enjoyed learning about the different cultures that she encountered and was also a member of her college's Russian club, helping her remember her roots. She also was a member of the college's newspaper team, where she worked as a photographer and, on occasion, she wrote a few articles. One of her main goals in life was to help other people, a character trait that was echoed by her brother, who's been quoted as saying, quote, there was nothing bad about her. She was incredible. She was clearly a driven individual who had big plans for the future, and thanks to her nature, it seemed that she was set on the road to success. But Ira's story would soon take a tragic turn as she was robbed of that future in the most heinous way possible, when someone took her life. At just after 1 p.m. on Monday, the 5th of May, 2008, Dennis Loveless and his girlfriend, Brenda Pierce, got the shock of their lives when they were out jet skiing on the Catawba River in North Carolina. While out on their excursion, they noticed something odd lying on the riverbank, and they decided to investigate. But when they got closer, they were horrified to discover a woman's body lying by the side of the river. They knew they had to inform the authorities immediately, and so Brenda decided to ride her jet ski to a nearby bait shop, where she would call 911. At the same time, Dennis remembered seeing someone working at a nearby construction site, and he ran over to ask if they could contact the police as well. During the 911 call, Brenda stated, quote, there's a car that's run off the embankment and a body lying there. I don't know if they're alive or not and police officers were immediately dispatched to the riverbank. When authorities arrived on the scene, they unfortunately discovered that it was Irina's body that had been found, and she was located next to her car, a Saturn, that had seemingly left the road and crashed into a stump that was hidden in the dense brush, just a short distance away from the water. What struck them as strange was the fact that both the doors on the driver's side were open, but the airbags hadn't deployed from the collision with the stump. Stranger still, Irina's car keys were found lying in the back of the car on the driver's side. The engine was off, and strangest of all, the car was in neutral. Just about every detail from this scene just didn't make sense. If Irina's passing was the result of her crashing into the stump, she surely wouldn't have been able to put the car in neutral before turning off the engine, removing the keys from the ignition, and then opening the back door and dropping the keys. It would have been nearly impossible after such an impact. Something just didn't seem right about this scene. A short distance away, Irina was found lying on the ground with her feet closest to the water, and in one hand, she was holding onto a vine. It was also noted that her hair and the clothes that she was wearing were soaked. While attempting to figure out what had happened here, investigators initially assumed that she'd driven herself to the river, where she'd then gotten out of the car and ended her own life. But this opinion quickly changed upon a closer inspection of her body. It was discovered that she had three marks on her neck that suggested that she'd been strangled and then left by the side of the river. A further search uncovered three ligatures, 
and it was quickly determined that Irina's killer used these to end her life. It was later revealed that the first came from the sweatshirt that she was wearing. The second was a blue ribbon that was a perfect match for another ribbon that was tied to her bag, which was still in the car. And the third was a bungee cord, similar to one that was discovered in the car's trunk. They also found a camera in her trunk, but its film had been removed. But the strangest detail of all was also found in the car's trunk, a half-eaten burger from Wendy's. Ira was vegetarian. The first order of business was to interview everyone who was present in the area when Irina was discovered. Dennis and Brenda recounted their experience of stumbling across her body and reiterated they were merely out on the river to do some jet skiing. The nearby construction workers added that they'd only become aware that something was wrong once Dennis showed up, asking them to call 911. Several people walked past the scene while it was being processed, and they were also questioned, but no one had seen anything, and they were just as shocked by the discovery as Dennis and Brenda were. But there was one man who'd been present this whole time as he was fishing about 100 yards from where Irina's body was found. 39-year-old Mark Carver told investigators that he and his cousin, Neil Casada, were unaware of anything that had happened and added that he hadn't seen anything suspicious or untoward in the time that he'd spent next to the water. When asked to recount the movements of that day, he stated that he and Neil had arrived at the river at around 11 that morning and they immediately started getting their fishing equipment ready. They'd been there for about an hour when they became aware of a strange sound further down the river and Mark described it as sounding similar to a bulldozer scraping along the ground. He gave his and his cousin's information to the investigating officers, after which he left to pick up his daughter, presumably from school. He did return again later that same afternoon, and when asked why he was back, he claimed to have left his fishing net behind, but he was stopped from entering the area. He returned the next day after the area was accessible again, but was still unable to locate his net. Ira's car was then towed away to a secure garage, where it was processed for fingerprints by the Gaston County Police Department. This was done on the 5th and the 7th of May. Strangely, there seemed to be no reason for Ira to be in that area, since it was around 20 miles from her residence, and the only plausible explanation was that she'd traveled to the river with someone she knew, or she'd been forced to drive there by someone who had nefarious intentions. Mark had only given an informal statement at this point, and on the 15th of May, he was asked to provide an official account of his time next to the river. He stated that he saw Dennis and Brenda while they were jet skiing on the water, but added that there was also another boater present. He said that he heard Dennis speaking to the man in the boat, asking him to call 911, but he was adamant that he had no idea that a body had been found until he saw a news story about the case on the news. Since Mark and Neil were the only ones who were in the area when Ira's body was found, investigators decided to take a closer look at their lives and circumstances. They found that Mark was retired thanks to a medical disability. Mark's arrest record showed that he'd been taken into custody twice in the past. One of those instances occurred in 2007 when he and his son were wrestling and somehow he'd ended up accidentally wounding him with his firearm. Neil was also interviewed on several occasions, but he was adamant that they'd never heard anything strange other than the sound that they heard and the sound of voices talking about calling 911. But they did allow for their DNA samples to be taken. The next step in the investigation was to try and create a timeline of Ira's movements before she was found by the river. Police found that on the day that she lost her life, Ira went to a bank in Charlotte at around 10.17 a.m., where she deposited some money into her account. She then traveled to a Goodwill store, also in Charlotte, where she dropped off a few bags of clothing at about 10.33 a.m. Following that, she went to Jackson's Java Coffee Shop, where she did a few shifts a week, though she didn't have a shift this day and was presumably just visiting with her co-workers while having a cup of coffee. They then found a strange piece of footage captured by CCTV security cameras in the area of the YMCA in Belmont. The footage showed Ira's car arriving at the building at 11.09 a.m., but instead of stopping and getting out, it showed the car driving around the parking lot before suddenly leaving again one minute later. Unfortunately, the security footage was somewhat blurry, and investigators were unable to see whether Ira was alone in the car or not. As the car left the parking lot, it could be seen driving in the direction of the river, where it would eventually be found a few hours later. This is where the trail went cold, as no one had seen Ira after that, and her car wasn't captured on any further security cameras. The interesting thing is, Ira hadn't been sexually assaulted. It didn't seem as though she'd been robbed, 
and by all accounts, she was an extremely likable person who got along with just about everyone she met. So for investigators, there was one big question. Was Ira alone in that car, or was there someone with her? There was some speculation between detectives that this was a crime of opportunity. But even if this was the case, what was the motive for ending Ira's life? When a crime like this is committed, it's usually out of jealousy, a robbery that's gone wrong, a planned hit, or because of a rivalry, among other reasons. But none of these seemed to fit with Ira's crime, since she had no enemies and hadn't gotten into any trouble before she lost her life. Two months after Ira was found, her car was swabbed for DNA, along with the three ligatures that were determined to have been used to end her life. The processing of DNA evidence like this is a very timely process that usually takes several days, maybe even a couple weeks to complete. But it would be a few months after Ira's car was swabbed that the results finally came back, and they seemed to confirm the investigators' darkest suspicions. While it was reported that mixed DNA profiles were found in the car, the lab stated that a match had been found on the swabs taken from the car's driver's side back door, specifically the pillar above the door. It was found to be a match for Mark, who claimed to have never seen Ira or her vehicle. But his DNA wasn't the only DNA that was present in the car. They also reported that they found a match from swabs taken from the armrest of the front passenger door and inside the window of the same seat. This DNA matched Neil. It was now up to investigators to prove that the two cousins were in or around Ira's car at some point, and to do so, they had to establish what their movements were that morning. They found that the two men had indeed made plans to go fishing that morning, but only met up at the river later on. Mark had traveled to a store where he picked up a salt block that was intended for Neil's goats. Since the block was too heavy for Mark to carry on his own, he asked an employee at the store to carry it to his car. The employee did so and placed it in his car's trunk. Following this, he drove to the College Park Pharmacy, where he dropped off a prescription at 10.52 a.m. He then went to the river, to a spot where he and some of his family members had been fishing in the past. And a short while later, Neil arrived to retrieve the salt block from Mark's vehicle. Neither of the men could carry the block on their own, since Mark had carpal tunnel and Neil was suffering from a heart condition. But they eventually helped each other transfer it from one car to the other. According to Mark's statement, they then heard the strange scraping sound at around noon. And a short while later, Neil left, but Mark decided to keep fishing. He was then approached by a police officer after Ira's body was discovered and was only allowed to leave at around 2.30 p.m. after he'd been interviewed and supplied the police with his identification, as well as his and Neil's contact information. He then drove away from the river and returned to the pharmacy to pick up the medication from the prescription that he'd dropped off earlier that morning. An employee at the pharmacy remembered seeing him that afternoon and told investigators that when Mark arrived, the case was being discussed on a television in the store. Mark told the worker that he'd been at the scene, but didn't know anything about the incident other than being told someone had been shot. When he and Neil returned to the river later that day, Iris' car was being removed from the scene, and hence they were not allowed to go to their fishing spot. Considering their DNA was found at the scene, the two men were later brought in for questioning. Neil remained adamant that neither he nor Mark had been anywhere near Iris' car. The interrogators decided to lie to him by telling him that his cousin was in another interrogation room and that he had implicated Neil in the crime. But he remained steadfast in his statement that he had never seen the vehicle in question. It was then found that Mark wrote and read at a first grade level, and after testing, it was determined that he had an IQ level of 61, which matches with a clinical level of mental disability. Investigators then spoke to several doctors about Mark's physical conditions, and they confirmed that he was considered as disabled. They added that thanks to the carpal tunnel, he had a very weak grip strength and often had trouble holding on to something as light as a pen. Speaking of the DNA evidence that was found at the scene, DNA other than Ira's was found on all three ligatures that were collected for evidence, but neither Mark's nor Neil's DNA was present. 13 other areas of the car were swabbed, none of which showed any signs of the two cousins' DNA, and DNA collected from under Ira's nails also didn't match the two men either. Nonetheless, investigators felt strongly that either both men or one of the two had something to do with Ira's passing, and the decision was made for them to be taken into custody. At least eight other people had their DNA tested, and hence must have been considered suspects at some point, but they were quickly cleared, leaving Mark and Neil as the only remaining suspects.
Both men were still adamant that they were innocent, but the trial dates were set and it would be decided that they would be tried separately after being charged with first degree homicide. Though the day before Neil's trial was set to start, he unexpectedly passed away from a heart attack. Before Mark's trial started, he was given the chance to plead guilty in exchange for a lighter sentence of between four and eight years in prison, but he refused, stating that he couldn't plead guilty to a crime that he didn't commit. And so Mark's trial went ahead. The prosecution made the case that Ira had traveled to the river on her own to take some photos, but while she was there, she caught the two cousins in a compromising position and took photos of them. They claimed that this would have angered the two men, who then decided to end her life before removing the film from the camera, then placing the camera back in the trunk of the car. There was also never any mention of whether or not either man's DNA was found on the camera, or even their fingerprints for that matter. A detective testified that the camera counter showed that two photos had been taken, which he found strange since there was no film inside. He later found out that this particular camera's counter could advance without any film being present, but he failed to mention this in court. But this is where another strange detail in the case arose. The defense was in possession of documents showing that the detectives knew that no film had to be present for the counter to work, but they failed to mention this at all, effectively ignoring a crucial piece of evidence. Basically, they knew that they were lying, or at the very least, stretching the truth, but chose to use this misguided evidence to try to convict this man anyway. Not a good look. At this point, three things were clear in this case. First, Mark was definitely in the area where Ira's life was taken. Second, his DNA was found to be present in the car. And lastly, he had at some point mentioned that he knew how tall Ira was, despite stating he'd never seen her before in his life. Further hurting Mark's case was testimony from an officer who stated that he could clearly hear other officers speaking in normal volumes while he was standing at Mark's fishing spot, meaning Mark and Neil would have certainly heard Ira's car crashing into the stump as well as the attack that followed. It would have been painfully loud given their location, and this proved the men may have been lying. In the end, Mark's defense team only relied on the fact that the prosecutors couldn't definitely prove that Mark and Neil were guilty. Yes, they proved that the two had maybe lied, but that's it. The defense called no witnesses, didn't enter any items into evidence, and seemingly hoped that the jury would acquit Mark thanks to a lack of evidence. But this is not what happened. The jury found Mark guilty on all charges. On the 21st of March, 2011, he was sentenced to life in prison. Mark would appeal this sentence in 2012 and 2013, but was unsuccessful on both occasions. But unexpectedly, in 2019, a judge stated that Mark should be given a new trial, since there were several discrepancies in the evidence that were never brought to the jury's attention. To start with, the jury had never seen Mark's interrogation video, which showed a detective leading him into saying that he knew how tall Ira was. Furthermore, one of the responding officers failed to mention that he shook Mark's hand after questioning him and then returned to the crime scene, thereby possibly transferring Mark's DNA to the vehicle, where it was later picked up by swabs. Since Ira's car's doors were seen left open in some of the pictures, but were closed in others, officers had to have touched the doors at some point before DNA evidence was collected, meaning the DNA evidence collected was totally unreliable. The defense also failed to mention that Mark was mentally disabled or that he suffered from carpal tunnel syndrome, which would have made it impossible for him to carry out the crime, as he couldn't have tied the ligatures that were found at the scene. Thanks to this judge coming forward, Mark's conviction was finally overturned and on the 11th of June, 2019, he was released from prison on a bond of $100,000. He was also ordered to wear an ankle monitor while awaiting a retrial. A new hearing date was set for the 16th of August, 2022, but this trial would never take place as the charges against Mark were finally dropped on the 12th of August, as there simply wasn't enough evidence to link him to the crime. Mark is now a free man, but this means that Ira's case is still unsolved and the person responsible for her crime has never been identified. It's a heartbreaking fact that this case had a major negative impact on two different families, neither of which received the answers they deserve. In Ira's case, how could someone claim the life of an innocent young woman? In Mark's case, how could a team of investigators seemingly knowingly convict a man who was 100% innocent? It's been mentioned in various forums that evidence exists proving that certain unnamed individuals may have been responsible for Ira's crime, but there seems to have been no further progress in her case, which means that there's been no closure for her family and they still have no idea what happened to her on that fateful day.
To top this off, a criminal is now running free, never having paid for his actions against this poor woman. As for Mark and his family, he spent nearly eight years in prison despite a massive discrepancy in the case's evidence. And even now that he's been released, he hasn't received so much as an apology for the years of his life that he'll never get back. This case seems like a true crime story that just keeps on giving. At every possible angle, there's just so much more and more hurt and never any answers. There's no word on whether or not the police are still investigating the case. If they are, they've certainly made no progress in the last few years, at least not that's been publicly mentioned. I just hope, for Ira's family's sake, they will eventually get to the bottom of this so that her loved ones can finally get a bit of closure, and maybe even a small amount of peace. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.